Tony Rana, thanks for joining today at the Fairbanks Center to discuss this most recent summit between President Xi and President Biden. I uh, wanted to start by just asking you, what do you think was the most significant development from the summit, besides the fact that the two sides are simply just talking again? Actually, I think that is the most important thing, to be quite honest. Um, the fact that they were able eventually to pull together a meeting is, of course, significant. And I think what it does is it licenses discussions to take place at different levels within the administration. I think everybody's been frustrated that there's no way to move forward because there's no clear signal from the top. So I think that's, that's my main takeaway in addition to the very specific, a couple of specific things they agreed. And here you're talking specifically about the Xi administration, I take it, or do you think the same applies here on the American side? I think the well? same applies on the American side. I mean, I think um, even though Washington for a long time has been trying to uh, get involved in engagement with the Chinese side, I think there's sort of still a reticence about how far do you go, how friendly is it going to be, how criticized am I going to be if I move too forward too fast. Rana. I think? think there are a couple of concrete things that did emerge. They're low level, but they're useful in terms of building the relationship in the way that Tony's just been talking about. One is the resumption of military to military contacts, which were something that were mainstream uh, just a few years ago. And then a bit of a deterioration on both sides meant that essentially the, those contacts broke up. And for a while, the Chinese were at least implying that actually the reestablishment of those ties might be against their own interests because they essentially made a case of what's known as moral hazard. In other words, that if the Americans thought they had those channels, then they might be inclined to push further in the seas which China disputes with its neighbors, South China Sea in particular. Um, it's clear now that they regarded actually the danger of there being an escalation of an incident in those waters as being more important. And the fact that now at least there is some sort of hotline in which they can talk to each other is important. The other thing I'd flag up is the agreement on climate change. Again, I don't think any of us thinks that this is going to be the one lever that essentially gets pulled and solves the problem. We're a very long way from that. But the fact, again, that John Kerry and Xie Jianhua, the uh, main uh, the leaders of the climate change negotiations on both sides, are talking again is at least a sign that at least at the bottom level there is some sort of uh, decent conversation that can go on even at times of political turmoil. I just want to pick up again on this question of restoring the military relations. Because that is important. I mean, if we look at the wandering balloon incident from earlier this year, one of the things I heard from U.S. administrators was nobody picked up a phone. And what we do know is that China is very bad at crisis management. If we look back to the Hainan plane incident in 2001, if we look back to the incident of the NATO bombing, it's very difficult for the Chinese system to respond. So at least having some acknowledgement that there needs to be uh, some kind of... Uh, conversation between the militaries I think is very important given that if we think about where is potential for conflict, South China Seas, East China Seas and of course the whole question of cross-straits relations with Taiwan. So in some ways and I think it'd be fair to say that we've had a year of incidents that have caused us to reach an adhere with regards to U.S.-China relations. Uh, both the Pelosi visit to Taiwan as well as the balloon incident that you referenced. Uh, but we're back to sort of where we were, right, uh, 18 months ago, mm -hmm. one could say. Uh, but do you see anything from this summit that would suggest that the strategic rivalry or this era of new great power competition, uh, the structural issues, any progress on that, or we're, we're locked in this for the medium term? I think we're locked in medium to long term. I mean, I, the phrase we heard earlier was, let's get back to Bali, which was, of course, the last time the two of them met. I don't see a lot of uh, progress uh, coming out of this rather than let's at least stabilize things as far as we can. And I think it was heralded by some of the comments subsequently when uh, President Biden made clear that he still thinks Xi Jinping is a dictator and uh, Xi Jinping now moving from the Pacific Ocean being big enough for the two of us to now the whole world being big enough for the two of us, which I think indicates uh, their intentions for the future. So I think it's going to be a relationship which is always going to be liable uh, to be rocked by unexpected current events. Because we think about it, there is no 
stable underpinning analysis of why the relationship is there. Um, in previous iterations, of course, anti-Soviet uh, was there. Then, of course, there was the phase of development under Deng Xiaoping. And now it is so pragmatically driven that I think it's always vulnerable to sudden events and sudden shifts. I think that's right. I mean, I suppose in a sense, if the move has been from uh, the Pacific's big enough for the both of us to the world is big enough, next time it'll be outer space, of course, <laughs> which is the only place that we can go. Right. The way things are going, actually, that may well be the next frontier right. that we're, uh, we're talking about when we gather, uh, gather again. I think that we are absolutely caught between two different scales in terms of time. One is the short term. And I think one of the things that is a relief from this uh, summit is that at least in the next year, couple of years, it seems reasonable to, to expect that things will be relatively calm. So for the next year or so, it seems to me that the Chinese uh, side are going to wait for the results of the US presidential election, yeah. let alone, of course, the Taiwan elections, which are coming up in just a month or so time and which seem to be changing almost day by day in terms of who might well be getting to the, the top. So from Beijing's point of view, there's no sense in making any very fast and rash moves. But I think what Tony has been getting at, and I, 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 I think this is right, is that the longer term trajectory is more difficult to predict, precisely because there's no one driving dynamic under it, but also because there are certain things which it seems at the moment will be very difficult for China to deflect itself from. One is the question of trying to find, again, this, this sort of broad term, a resolution, a solution to the Taiwan question. Well, the problem is, that, of course, both sides are asking different questions about Taiwan, mm -hmm. and Taiwan itself, of course, has its own say in these issues too. So that is something that I think is, is going to be continue to be a real problem. But I would suggest one other thing, which perhaps doesn't always filter in quite so much, which is that there's a sense, there's a sense in which central though the resolution of Taiwan's situation is from Beijing's point of view, it does sit slightly separately from some of the other problems that are, have, been, have been covered at the, at the summit. Climate change, uh, the changing nature of global trade, uh, the question of whether or not there should be restrictions on technology exports and so forth. At one level, these are more of a sort of supercharged version of existing problems, which can, to some extent, have the edges rubbed off. It's only Taiwan, which to some extent looks a bit more like a sort of binary issue. Well, I, I think what's important is that all the issues that Rana raised are things really which uh, China would like America to make concessions exactly. on. And that is the problem. I mean, you know, China already has made a very substantial shift from, uh, say, March around the time of the National People's Congress with the then now disgraced foreign minister and Xi Jinping himself really making it very clear all the problems lie with America and that, you know, China being incapable of accepting responsibility for its own actions, of course, put all the problems onto America's shoulders. The fact that it then turned around to uh, wanting desperately to have this summit uh, and uh, willing to negotiate in the summit around one or two things which are important for America, I think it showed some flexibility. But I really think it ends, it ends there. I think it's difficult for China to make other concessions that are going to be appealing to America. It's it's going to carry on uh, despite its attempt to woo uh, U.S. business. It will carry on, I would imagine, with the same economic policies, the same trading practices. It's not, it cannot give up anything it says uh, about Taiwan. Uh, it's critical of this small yard high fence that America talks about. So there's really not much room left, I think, for China to show any other flexibility because, as I said, it essentially thinks the flexibility has to come from the U.S. One of the most striking things I thought if there was flexibility it would have been in some of the economic reform questions to bolster domestic confidence and to try to attract foreign mm -hmm. investment back. As stark as those trends are, we heard very little in San Francisco. We heard a lot of platitudes, <laughs> uh, but in terms of concrete policies there. I think it's, it's important to widen the perspective as well, particularly when thinking about the sort of stalemate between the United States and, uh, and China. Because we should remember this wasn't just, there was, of course, a summit between Biden and, uh, uh, and Xi, but technically, of course, that was the sideshow to APEC, exactly. the wider Asia-Pacific gathering. And I thought that one of the most interesting gatherings, for instance, was the Sino-Japanese one, where actually Prime Minister Kishida and Xi Jinping also met, also talked about a variety of issues. Uh, Japan also made uh, the case that, you know, uh, 
businessmen who've been arrested in China should be released. And broadly speaking, the two sides kind of agreed to, to disagree. But I think what's also interesting is that the number of other swing players, countries in Southeast Asia in particular, have a very strong vested interest actually in the US and China breaking their logjam. When we think about the fact that many of these actors, when you ask them frankly and properly in private, have no interest in the US retreating in security terms from the region <laughs> at all. They may say in public that they feel more neutral. In reality, of course, as the Philippines shows, they'd be very worried if the US actually left. And yet the China market matters a great deal. And also phenomena such as the growing amount of FDI that's coming out of China into Southeast Asia, also technologies, uh, electric vehicle batteries, which will be important for areas such as the, the, the Malaysian small automobile sector. So I think remembering the rest of the Asia Pacific region is one of the ways in which both the Chinese and the American sides need to think themselves through what something that's too often, I think, seen as a pure binary as opposed to a binary uh, with additional benefits, if you want to put it that way. Well, yeah, I think that's an important point that um, I think that was one of the pressures on Washington to actually try and stabilize the relations is that the allies in the region and elsewhere really want that stable relationship that Ron is talking about because you've got this division in Asia which has been acknowledged for a long time. You have the security Asia which is driven by the US with all the previous and the more recent agreements which of course China cannot but see as uh, containing and constraining its actions. And then as Rana rightly said, you've got the economic Asia where China is increasingly playing the major role. And, you know, all those countries are juggling. How do they, you know, can we have both? And you certainly can't have both if there's a hostile relationship between the two capitals. Well, one of the things I think has been interesting is I, I think there's been two pe competing narratives uh, about how you get to a more stable framework uh, between the U.S and its allies in the region, right? One is the old managed coexistence mm -hmm. narrative, which most of the US allies would prefer along those lines. And the other is this compete, align, invest, or what we could generally term this, right, strategic competition mm -hmm. right. narrative. And I think what this summit showed, but more importantly, what APEC showed, right, is between this and the development from the G20 and the G7 and so forth is really Washington has been able to persuade its allies to move forward away from thinking, oh, we need to get back to managed coexistence mm -hmm. to thinking about how do we work together in an era of strategic competition. I think that's right. I would add one other factor that was you know, literally missing, but actually very important, which is the role of India. India is not a member of APEC, but in fact, of course, was visible just a few weeks ago, really, at the G20 summit uh, and also the BRICS summit, uh, sorry, at the G20 summit. Uh, and also, of course, because of China's absence on that occasion, not turning up at New Delhi on that particular occasion. Um, it's clear that both in security terms and economic terms, both China and the US have important, or they're rather different sorts of conversations to have with India at the moment. On the one hand, from the American side, clearly the enthusiasm for India to be part of the quad arrangements in naval terms with the Australians and the Japanese is seen as a way of essentially trying to prevent the growth of Chinese military and naval presence in the region, although of course it's never phrased that way. But I think there's a more interesting combination that potentially is there between China and India, which is in the next tier of technology. I mean, Put perhaps very simplistically, you could argue that there is a decade coming up in which Chinese technology infrastructure and Indian technology services could be a very powerful combination if the two can actually find any kind of compatibility. I think that's one of the big understated questions of the next decade that really uh, sits behind that question of the, uh, the negotiations that the US and China were having, but with India sort of ghost at the feast and not actually present. Well, I think uh, we had Ambassador Juster here a few weeks ago, and I think what was interesting from that conversation was clearly the geopolitical mistrust between the two sides is standing in the way of that type of synergistic combination, which would make sense if we were back in an era of efficiency, but we're not. And so I think that will also shape the terms of this economic competition of India's game seems to be how much can they attract Plan B away from Vietnam or the rest of Southeast Asia, and the course of that really grow into the physical infrastructure space beyond simply services. Yeah, I think it's um, 
it's difficult for MNCs really to uh, pick up their bags and leave China. I mean, if you think about, say, something like the Foxconn plant, although it's now being investigated, two or 300,000 yeah. workers, China built the dormitories, China built the roads to there. You know, what other country in the world is going to be able to provide that sort of infrastructure for those companies? So it's not surprising that uh, you know, US companies and, and other Western companies are all grappling with you know, how do we find that kind of space yeah. to keep operating in China while knowing that there's increasing sort of threats coming from Washington uh, as a part of that process. Um, and I think you know, it was quite clear that General Secretary Xi recognized that by holding the business dinner. And from what we heard, wanting to have the business dinner before he met with President Biden. And of course, uh, White House rightly wouldn't agree to that. But I think it shows that, uh, you know, Beijing knows that they have a potential ally uh, in the business community, particularly now in the finance part of the business community, to push for a more stable relationship and continued engagement. One... Um Chinese um, side bureaucrat who I spoke to a little while ago said that he thought the most important visit in recent months to China for an American was not Chuck Schumer or Gina Raimondo, but Elon Musk, because mm -hmm. essentially that got to the heart of that question of whether or not US business actually can be something that sits as a pivot between the you know, increasingly tense security arrangement between the two countries and the hope that there is still sufficient market for all comers uh, in, uh, in China. And I think that remains to be seen at the moment, but certainly the Chinese have an interest in making it appear that the market is not closed, that the window is not too narrow when it comes to US interests. And they've been strategic. I mean, they gave Tesla 100% stake, which was unusual. They've allowed, uh, even though they promised it a long time before, Amex, that they could start doing local currency dealing. They've opened up for some of the financial uh, services. But I think it's interesting. Um, they've opened up the financial services when they can't really be a threat within China, where China already has a strong uh, domestic financial sector, or can only take a small sliver, but a big enough sliver to make Wall Street say, we want a good relationship. And Tesla, of course, yeah, 100% now, but you know, one wonders how long it's going to be before BYD and others sort of narrow the space and it becomes less profitable for Tesla operating there. And then areas where it would have really mattered, right, politically, Boeing, for example, and right, the Max, um, are thinking about agricultural mm -hmm. elements, particularly, um, or if it came to right, simply vaccines, biotech, and so forth. Um, there are clear areas where China could move forward in terms of its own domestic reform interests, but it's not doing so because of political uh, elements. And so I, I, I'm skeptical that, you know, that even though they recognize business can be this hedge, business uh, has not been cultivated nearly as extensively as it mm -hmm. could be. Well, I think that one of the things that we still don't know enough about is quite what the political dynamics are at the top in Chinese government. I think we're all aware that Xi Jinping is clearly the driving force in terms of politics, but what different viewpoints there might be about open versus closeness to investment, about the question of markets versus a whole variety of ideological and political controls. These are things that we speculate about. We have some indications that come from within the system, but a lot of us feel that it would be great to know even more about something inside the black box of the top leadership. Well, thank you both for joining. I, I think we can all agree, um, despite the fact that there were just a few agreements, the fact that the two sides are talking again is a positive sign as far as stabilizing the relationship is concerned. But I think we all agree the real fireworks to come are what happens in domestic politics, and there's going to be quite a bit on both the Chinese and U.S. side as well as in Taiwan the months to come. So we'll look forward to perhaps a slightly different landscape by the, time, the next time the U.S. and China talk again. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you, Mark. You. Looks like uh, we'll be back here for another Fairbank yeah. conversation sometime soon.